The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The word of the Lord. May grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My name is Chris Odie, and I serve as the pastor of the Livingstones Prison Congregation. It's an honor to be here with you today. It's been about a year since the last time I spoke to Agnes Day, albeit last time it was in person, and I look forward to when we can all be back together and do it again that way. So many of you already have a sense of what Livingstones is, and still, I'm going to take a moment to explain it, just in case anybody's new or just likes to hear it again. So bear with me. It will tie back to today's scripture, to the ministry of Agnes Day, as well as your own life. In worst case, I am online and pre-recorded, which means that you can go grab a refill for your coffee. So, Living Stones is a ministry started by and primarily sponsored by Lutheran churches in southwestern Washington for the past 14 years. It is, as it sounds like, a congregation inside a prison. It is a ministry that operates inside the Washington Correction Center in Shelton, one of our men's facilities here in Washington State. And it is a ministry that focuses on, focuses on connecting incarcerated men, regular volunteers, visitors from outside congregations, developing reentry resources, and um, also speaking to groups on the outside, either on a Sunday morning or community groups during the week. Pre-pandemic, we were getting close to starting a second site at one of the prisons in Monroe, or one of the facilities in Monroe, sponsored by the Northwest Washington Synod and connected to many ecumenical volunteers up there. And the plan is still, once the pandemic is over, to actually do that. The work that we do is important. But I need to tell you that right now, in the midst of COVID, it is all the more important. Due to the pandemic, the Washington Department of Corrections made the decision back in March to basically shut down the prisons to visitors and volunteers in order to protect the inmates and the staff. As a result, that means that there is pretty much no outside programming. And the chapel at WCC, where I work, has been converted into a regional recovery center for inmates who test positive in Washington State which means that we now worship in the dining hall, the staff dining hall, which is uh, fragrant. I'll put it that way. Due to my badge status, I am still able to get inside, even though our volunteers cannot. But that means that when I go inside and help lead worship for some of the Christian groups or spend time with other guys, whether they're part of those groups or not, that means that we are one of the well, actually, we're really the only outside programming still happening at WCC these past six months. And realistically, we expect that this could be the situation going into 2021. So I want to thank you for welcoming me here today. I want to thank you for supporting Living Stones over the years. And I want to really emphasize that it is only because of the support of congregations like Agnes Day and individuals like yourself that we are able to do this work at all, but especially right now. It is, as you would imagine, harder for us to get support these days. So I encourage you to please consider checking out our website, livingstonesprisoncongregation.com. I know it's a long name, but all the words are simple to spell, so that's nice. You can check out some footage that we have shot from inside the prison before the pandemic. You can sign up to receive our monthly newsletter. You can even send uh, devotionals or other materials that we can then put in a newsletter that goes inside to the men that frankly means a lot to them 
We can always use more contributions for that. Um, you can donate electronically. Please feel free to go ahead and do that. And you can just keep abreast of what we're up to. Every month we do a ministry check-in on Zoom. You are very much invited to be a part of that as well. And uh, that's it. That's the basics of Living Stones right now. So I thank you for sitting through what I often call the pitch, but also recognizing that, honestly, without it, without support from folks like yourself, we could not do this. So thank you. Thank you on behalf of the men, the volunteers who so badly want to be allowed back inside but are having to wait. Thank you for all that you have done and will do in the future. So on to scripture. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? What will they give in return for their life? Now, I don't know about you, but for as far back as I can remember, I have always been interested in history, in facts, in figures, in people and places, in the minutia of history, the, the various ways in which it fits together. The world in which we live is indescribably shaped by the route in which we got here. And I find value in trying to better understand that route and learn from it. At the end of the day, personally, I would rather learn and adjust from the mistakes and triumphs of the past than waste a lot of time or energy recreating them. You've probably heard it said at one point or another, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And of course, there is that corollary. I don't know why I wanted to use that word since I can't pronounce it. Those who learn from history are doomed to live with those who fail to learn from it. That's the point where I say something about the fact that, you know, we had a pandemic 100 years ago and learned that masks and social distancing was important. Who could have thought? Anyway, by extension from that love for history, I think about legacies a lot. I don't know if I do it more than other people do, but it feels to me like it crosses my mind a lot. I don't mean legacy in an arrogant way, but I mean legacy in the sense of how our lives, our institutions, our actions leave an impact, what those ripples look like, how they play out over the years, not just for ourselves, but for others, for our communities. You know, some of it is internal. I just, as far back as I can recall, I've always felt this strong need to leave things better than I found them. You know, Living Stones is my third call as a pastor. My first two were what are called redevelopment calls, which is where you serve a struggling congregation and try to help them um, rethink and reimagine how they minister in their community. You know, it's all about taking something that already exists and trying to, um, to make it better, to help it to do its work better going forward. And a huge piece of how you do that is learning from a congregation's past and helping them to understand how to honor that past without worshiping it. And I'm pretty sure as soon as I said that, some of you know what I mean. Because, frankly, I have yet to meet a congregation, whether as a pastor, as a congregant, or as a visitor, I have yet to meet a congregation that didn't have at least a few folk who were distracted by their worship for the way things used to be. You follow me? Worshiping the idea of the way things used to be. And I say worship deliberately. Because we learn from scripture that idolatry is not just about golden statues and pagan altars. Idolatry is anything that replaces God in our lives. And for many people, for many well-intentioned, good Christian people, the past becomes an idol to be worshipped in God's place. Don't always realize it. In fact, frequently don't realize it at all. But it frankly is what often has led to those congregations that I've done redevelopment work with. And unfortunately, it's part of what's helped them get to the need to need redevelopment, worshiping the past. But I think another reason I think about legacies so often is because I'm a pastor and I have done probably a hundred or so funerals over the years. The vast majority of them for people who I have never met, hearing stories about their lives and by extension, their legacies. And at the risk of sounding cliche, from that, I have learned a lot about what really matters. I have yet to have a child say, you know, I really wish dad had been home less. I wish he'd been home less often. I wish he'd worked more. 
I've yet to have a spouse say to me, you know, I really wish she'd been harder or colder. I wish she hadn't been so full of God's love. Nobody says at a funeral, you know, if only our relationship had been more distant. You know, I'm sure today would be much easier if we just hadn't cared about each other so much. I've yet to minister at a funeral where, you know, this person really just cared about other people too much. I've yet to minister at a funeral where that's been listed as a character flaw. Jesus today challenges his disciples, and by extension us, about what really truly matters in our life. They were sucked up in notions of power and glory. What they had understood the Messiah was supposed to be, the Christ, the anointed, was supposed to be. This holy warrior sent to cast out Roman oppressors and restore a theocracy. We all know that was mistaken. We all know the story of Jesus and his ministry and his gospel would turn out quite differently. Today, 2,000 years later, we know that. But in that time, in that place, the disciples are still very hooked into that. That's why Peter is so aghast at what Jesus has said about what his ark is going to look like. is because he is still focused on this idea of what triumph looks, looks like, what success looks like, what the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed looks like. And we know that what it looks like ultimately is a story of love and humility and sacrifice for others. And you've heard it before. You've heard about Jesus healing and blessing and forgiving people. And you've heard about the crucifixion and the resurrection. And how all of that is really truly a testimony to the failure of human hatred to conquer God's love. It is a testimony to what true power looks like, what true glory looks like, and yet, and yet. I dare say that for many of us today, for many well-intentioned, good Christian people, I dare say that many still get that wrong. Still get the idea of that glory and power wrong. I mentioned my love for history at the start. I have long thought that one of the best things to happen to Christianity was when Emperor Constantine made it legal, when it became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Some way back vestigial part of your brain just remembered that from history classes long ago. Oh, yeah, Constantine, that's right. No longer illegal to be, uh, to be a Christian. And it was one of the best things to happen to Christianity because people could worship safely and openly and the gospel could spread freely. And I have long thought that one of the worst things to happen to Christianity was when Emperor Constantine made it legal, when it became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Because in that moment, secular power and glory clutched their fingers around the heart of the church and its people. You want an example of Christians distracted, corrupted by power and glory? It's late August 2020. Google Jerry Falwell Jr. Actually, better, better don't. Just it's not worth it. We are preparing for an election in a couple months, but don't worry. I'm not about to get political. Or maybe I am. I, I don't know. At the end of the day, Jesus' gospel is inherently political. It's centered on how we treat our neighbor as much as how we live our relationship with God. And in that bit about neighbors makes it inherently political, whether we like it or not, whether we want to admit it or not. You literally cannot practice Christianity. You cannot practice Christianity faithfully and not care about your neighbor's well-being. You, you just can't. Like, those are intrinsically connected. As soon as your neighbor stops mattering, you have failed. As soon as the well-being of your neighbor is no longer important, you have failed at exercising, practicing Christianity. You just can't do it. They go, they cannot be broken apart. So, and I honestly didn't know that's where today's message was going to go. That's where it went. So when your ballot arrives, ask yourself if the person you're checking off generally reflects the gospel. 
reflects the love of God and neighbor we know in Christ, or if they generally reflect something else. If they reflect the world that Christ has called us to create, or they reflect something else. And if you're unsure where to start, I actually think Paul's reading today was amazing. Paul's words today are fantastic. And they are as good a measuring stick for crafting a legacy, a legacy as an individual, a legacy as a people, a legacy as a nation, as any could aspire to. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showering and showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink, for by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. If you want to leave a legacy as an individual, as a people, as a nation, those are the sorts of things we should aspire to. And those are the sorts of things that we should look to in our leaders. Every week I get this incredibly humbling experience of going inside a prison and working with a group of men who are so aware, for the most part, of when and how they have fallen short of that promise. A group of men who try so hard to not be who they were, to turn their lives around. It is an honor to serve as the pastor of Living Stones. And I thank you so much for the contributions and support that you have offered up that have blessed me to get to do that. Amen.